Channel 7 Eyewitness News with Bill Butel, Scott Clark with Sports, Sam Champion with the exclusive AccuWeather forecast, and the Eyewitness News team. Now, Eyewitness News. Good evening, I'm Bill Butel. There is no connection with the 300 Chinese who swam ashore Sunday in the Rockaways, but 13 Asians were held hostage in Brooklyn to a police rescued them earlier this morning. They were kidnapped, held for ransom, threatened with death. Lucy Yang has this story live in Brooklyn. Lucy? Bill, in cracking this latest safe house, police say their raid was more like a rescue because two of the illegal immigrants were about to be executed by their captors. After the Chinese immigrants were taken out of the safe house in the Sunset Park section of Brooklyn and to the precinct, police report they started singing happy Chinese songs as if they had been saved. Two of the 13 men have been held captive at the house for more than a year and time was running out. Detectives believe the two have been beaten, tortured by their captors and were about to be killed because their families in China still could not come up with enough money. I feel sorry for these people, I really do. I don't think that they should have to be under this uh, pressure to come here to try to make a living and then be... Uh, treat it like criminals and work for nothing. The Chinese immigrants ranged from as young as 16 years old to 30. They were allowed to work during the day, but neighbors say they were always escorted in and out of the basement. According to police, all the victims were held at gunpoint, but the guns were a joke. Authorities say they confiscated from the captors a BB gun, a fake 38 caliber which couldn't fire a thing, and some bullets. However, the threat was very real. Arrested and charged with kidnapping 17-year-old Annie Young, 18-year-old Vinnie Chow, and 20-year-old Joe Chung. Police believe they were a part of the Fuk Ching gang. We believe that as part of an international network of Chinese organized crime and Chinese gangs, a family in China sends one member to the United States by air or ship with the hope that uh, that person will work and earn enough money in this country to bring the rest of the family over here for a better life. The Fukchin gang is the same organized gang suspected of orchestrating Sunday's botched voyage when close to 300 Chinese immigrants tried to sneak into the country. Although the two are separate cases, all the immigrants are from the Fukian province of China. The common theme here, immigrants so desperate to live in America, they will sacrifice anything and everything. Detectives who spoke with some of the passengers say the immigrants knew life would be harsh, but they justified the risk by arguing even if they never see the American dream, perhaps their children will. The 13 illegal immigrants from this latest raid are still here at the precinct waiting to be brought down to immigration and naturalization, where it is pretty much a given they will ask for political asylum. We're live outside the 81st Precinct in Brooklyn, Lucy Yang, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Lucy, very much. Leona Helmsley, who's known as the Hotel Queen, may be a step closer to freedom tonight. Her lawyers heard from a judge today who is thinking about reducing her four-year sentence for tax evasion. Leona Helmsley has already served 14 months of the sentence. The judge re reserved his decision, but he did indicate that very soon now he's going to shorten her sentence. Well, his first trial was a mistrial, but the second time around, the jury says he was a deadly doctor. Dr. Medat Shanuda of Brooklyn, the jury convicted him of attempted murder, of trying to kill his wife with huge doses of insulin. His wife took the stand to defend him, and she wept at the jury's verdict. But today, a judge sentenced Dr. Shenouda to prison, and we have a report from Bertha Kuhn. Dr. Medhat Shenouda seemed poised and in control, even as Judge Alan Maris admonished him for using his power as a physician to try to murder his own wife as she lay in the hospital where he worked. He violated the trust of his patient, his wife, and the mother of his children. Shenouda was convicted of trying to kill his wife, Georgette, with insulin injections that sent her into a coma while she was a patient at Brookdale Hospital. Yet despite devastating evidence, Georgette Shenouda has stood by her husband, testifying Very for rare, him in the two defense, trials it took like to Dr. convict Shenouda. him, Defensive and submitting a letter to the court today. But she could not face the sentencing. She's not here, one, because she's living out of state now, and it was very inconvenient for her to leave her two children uh, and come to court. Secondly, in view of all the media attention this case has gotten, she didn't feel that she wanted to be exposed to it any further. Despite Mrs. Shenouda's faith in her husband, right. the judge has no doubt well the doctor is guilty. I can understand why this vulnerable woman might come to the defense of her husband and why she might have some doubt about what he did. 
I have no doubt this was the most overwhelming circumstantial evidence case that I have ever seen as a judge or before that an attorney. Mara sentenced Shenouda to a minimum of eight and one-third years and a maximum of 25 years, the most the law allows. Despite today's sentencing, Shenouda stands by his innocence and his lawyer says an appeal is planned. In Brooklyn, I'm Bertha Coombs, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Some parents on Long Island are warned tonight to check their children for symptoms of meningitis. A student at the Wantaw Elementary School was put in the hospital last week with the disease. The boy has not been in school since the 28th of May, but letters explaining the symptoms of meningitis were sent to parents and the school as a precaution. School officials feel confident there's nothing really to worry about. Incubation period has passed, and anyone who would have come down with meningitis as a result of any contact with this child already has would have had it, and there has been no other case reported in the school or in the school district. And health officials say they're waiting for test results to find out precisely what type of meningitis the student has. And there's some worry this evening over high amounts of lead in a Lower East Side playground, so much so that the playground has been closed to the public. The playground is in East River Park, just under the Williamsburg Bridge. The lead apparently is coming from paint chips from the bridge. Health officials say the level of lead in the park is dangerous, and you might recall recently the city spent half a million dollars to clean up the lead, but apparently it didn't work too well. The budget battle at City Hall shows no sign of coming to an end. Mayor Dinkins walked out of the negotiations this morning. The City Council is threatening to come up with its own budget. Mayor Dinkins and the City Council leadership are negotiating, negotiating to find $300 million in cuts so the mayor's $31 billion budget can be balanced. The city has until the end of the month to come up with a balanced budget. And still politics. The political battling among New Jersey Republicans will come to an end tonight at 8 p.m. when the polls close for primary day. Just one of three Republican contenders will go on to challenge Governor Jim Florio. He cast his vote today for the only Democrat on the primary ballot, that is himself. Christy Whitman hopes Republican voters will make her the state's first woman to be nominated for governor by a major party. She is up against Jim Walwork. It's his second bid for the Republican nomination. And it's also the second time out of the gate for Kerry Edwards. Doug Johnson right now at Edwards Election Headquarters in the Meadowlands Sheraton. Doug? Bill, this is the eighth time that Kerry Edwards has run for public office, three times for local council, three times for the assembly. Last time he ran for governor was his first unsuccessful race. That time he found himself coming in second in a five-way race. This year he has been in a very tough three-way primary. Most of the time he's appeared to be behind, but his campaign officials have said the race has tightened in the last few days. Kerry Edwards voted early this morning in Oakland, New Jersey, hoping no doubt that voting was on the minds of a lot of New Jersey Republicans. Getting out the vote has been a major effort for all the candidates in this race. Estimates have been the turnout would be small. Low turnout has been but one concern of the Republicans seeking to run for governor. Edwards has found himself in a three-way race and forced to come from behind Christine Todd Whitman. He has been tough on her. She has been unspecific, almost arrogant, avoiding issues, uh, talking in generalities. In the late stages of the campaign, Whitman fought back, attacking Edwards in TV ads and in debates, attacking Edwards' record when he was attorney general. Look at the New Jersey Unified Crime reports. Crime went up 9%. Her numbers are wrong. She's going on raw numbers. Reports. You have to add the population. As well as running against the other two candidates, Edwards is running against Jim Florio. Florio has made that more difficult than expected by making something of a comeback. However, Edwards says for true Republican voters, that's the issue, and he is the man. They want to be Jim Florio more than anything else, as they're the real hardcore Republicans. They're the ones who vote year in and year out in Republican primaries. And they think Jim Florio has, has been terrible for this state. And who can beat him is very important to them. Turnout's important in this race. And tonight, uh, Kerry Edwards will see whether those who did go to the polls believe he is the one to beat Jim Florio and whether his very basic message is getting through. Edwards will not appear here until after the polls are closed and this race has been decided. We're live in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Doug Johnson, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Thank you, Doug, and we'll be with you all through the evening as we cover the primary. When we come back now, a goose on the loose with an arrow in his chest. After days of searching, the rescuers find her, but can they save her life? We'll find out. And the dream of a trip abroad is shattered. For some high school students, after the tour company is grounded and their money disappears. Those stories, more, of course, next. It offers features like anti-lock brakes, traction control, 
touring suspension, and dual airbags. But if all that doesn't move you, perhaps its 214 horsepower engine will. The award-winning Eagle Vision TSI. Buy or lease one at your dealer today. See your tri-state Jeep and Eagle dealer. WABC-TV and Chemical Bank present the best of the class of 1993. Brought to you by Chemical Bank. Expect more from us. It's adorable, yes, isn't it? Sit down and it may be. Sit down, she wants everything. Is this fabulous or what? It's small. Which of you wants the place? I'll, I'll take it. Oh, uh-uh. That's a certified check I need. First and last, and don't forget the security. At Chemical, we guarantee you'll see a teller in under seven minutes, or we'll pay you $5. You're going to love it here. <laughs> fabulous. Oh, doll. Listen, don't worry. I've got a great place for you in the village. It's very artistic. Shadow and make no monthly payments till October. Plus, get a thousand dollars cash back. No, no, no. Own a hot looking shadow for as low as $74.47 and make no monthly payments till October. No monthly payments on shadow till October. No kidding. No, no, no. Some high school students in northern New Jersey worked and saved, their parents worked and saved. So the kids could go to Europe for a vacation later this month. They paid for their tickets, they got ready to pack, but the tour company went out of business last week, so their money may be gone and their trip may be a shattered dream. Victoria Cordera has the story. Summer in Europe was the dream of this group of students from Union Township, New Jersey. Twelve of them were set to leave for France in a couple of weeks. Seven others were heading for Germany next month. Until it all collapsed. Now it appears no one is going anywhere. And these people are out more than $30,000. I could understand how someone could just do this to young people and take their money and just run. Teachers and students met us armed with documentation of money paid in advance to Milestone Educational Institute, a Boston-based tour group. Word began to spread several days ago that it declared bankruptcy. And this is what you hear when you call there. Milestone Educational Institute Incorporated is suspending operations having encountered severe financial difficulties and cannot complete the scheduled tours. They hurt us, humiliated us, took us for granted, stole from us. We lost not only trust, but we lost a lot of money. Some 5,000 kids around the United States are affected by the collapse. Reports from Boston say company owner Christopher Kenyon has left the country. After we were told, we just sort of kind of gave up hope. Though it's almost like he didn't care. He's basically a thief. And he has our money, and we're left with no recourse other than to try to raise money for, to, have, to give the kids a similar opportunity. A fund has been set up to try to collect money from the community for the kids, and some travel groups have found European families willing to house them to help them defray expenses. But so far, only $100 is in the till. The kids still have fighting spirit, though. They're filing complaints, circulating petitions. We know it's not a miracle that we can get our money back, but at least maybe we would like an apology. They likely will not get an apology, and their parents fear what these kids are getting is an early lesson on the economics of fraud. In Union Township, Victoria Corderi, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. The Massachusetts Attorney General's Office has begun a criminal investigation of the tour company that's involved. A story that began with a very unhappy beginning has a happy ending tonight for a goose that was shot with an arrow that was lost and then found. It's recovering in Basking Ridge, New Jersey after leading animal control officers on literally a wild goose chase. They noticed the wounded bird on the Passaic River two weeks ago. They've been trying to catch it ever since. This morning, they finally succeeded. He came right up to me, all of them did, and started feeding them a little bit at a time. And he got close to the fence. As he got back to the fence, the tip of the arrow went inside the fence. I says, now or never because it's been a long two weeks, and I jumped on him, and I grabbed him. And the animal control officer says 
Lucky this was a target arrow rather than a hunting arrow. It had no barbs and the goose was able to live. Goose will be released back into the wild once it recovers. The Humane Society is offering a $1,000 reward for information as to who shot the goose. When we come back from south of the border, a first of its kind event, an art exhibit with a Latin flair, and a tragic accident deals a devastating blow to the New Jersey Nets and the basketball world. Scott Clark has reaction to the death of Drajan Petrovic, next in sports. Coming up on World News Tonight, political upheaval in Los Angeles. Democratic Mayor Tom Bradley is retiring, and for the first time in 20 years, Republicans may have a chance to take over the city hall here. The voting is today. We'll report from L.A. Jeopardy! has a challenge for everyone. In 1964 and 1967, this Cardinals pitcher was named World Series MVP. Make time to take the Jeopardy! challenge. Tonight at 7, here on Channel 7. These are my safari pictures. When you develop your film at CVS, you'll get either a free second set of jumbo prints or a free roll of film. I got the double prints for you. Oh, we wanted the film. Yeah, we wanted the film. At CVS, you'll find hundreds of CVS brand items guaranteed to perform as well as the more expensive national brands, which could add up to endless savings. Why pay more? It's Macy's One Day Sale, Wednesday, with spectacular store-wide savings, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. All women's bass canvas shoes, $19.99. All men's jockey underwear, one-third off. Save on a collection of elegant diamond jewelry, now 40 to 50% off. Christopher Hayes short sleeve dress shirts, $11.99 to $14.99. Plus, three hours of extra early morning specials starting 8 a.m. Macy's One Day Sale, Wednesday. In a side-by-side -side comparison with a Honda Accord, our car feels like a Honda Accord. It's just as comfortable as an Accord. Just ask my friend. The same amount of interior room as the Honda Accord. A thousand mile comparison to the Honda Accord. Be careful, the neighbors drive Accords. I want to... Against the Honda Accord. Accord. The Accord. The Accord. The Accord. Maybe you should set your sights. On the same car the automotive industry has. See your participating dealer for special limited time values. How does a 14-year-old cheerleader and a straight-A student turn to murder on the next ocean? Tomorrow at 4, followed by Eyewitness News here on Channel 7. Well, there's a lot of art with a Latin flair at the Museum of Modern Art here in Manhattan. 300 examples of Latin American art. They say it's the most extensive survey of Latin American art ever put together. Artists from Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, half a dozen other countries. Tim Fleischer went over today and took a look. Latin American art is finally getting its due. Beautiful works of art, all types of art, the works of Latin American artists of the 20th century. This exhibition, its curator believes, is about art. It is not so much about nationality. I think this art is part of the mainstream of Western art that's been unjustly ignored. And that is a key reason Waldo Rasmussen, as curator, has put together this major exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. There is a perception that Latin American art should look different from any other art produced. It doesn't look different from any art produced. It's part of Western art. It has its own individual cast. Individual like the work of Sildo Bireles, whose glove trotter was designed specifically for this show. First set out on a tabletop, now the floor, it is his interpretation of how some Europeans once saw the world falling off at the edge. For many years, Americans have been most receptive to the work of Latin American artists due to the fact that we share such close ties with many of the countries. So perhaps it is only fitting that after touring Europe since August of 1992, the final exhibition is here in the United States. While the 250 works of 90 artists cover eight categories, the Mexican muralists have always been a favorite. The best known art in the exhibition are the Mexican muralists, Rivera, Orozco, Tigueros, and of course Frida Kahlo, who has become uh, almost an icon. And that has only been in the last 10 years. Of Frida Kahlo's work, her haunting The Two Fridas is the best known, and this likely is the last time it will be part of a touring exhibition. There are works with political themes. This sculpture titled Unclassified, its medium discarded Defense Department material. This is, though, art created from many different influences. Influences shaped not just in Latin America, but influences as worldly as the artwork itself. Tim Fleischer, Channel 7, Eyewitness News.
There is nothing but tragedy tonight in the story of Drazen Petrovich. Scott Bill, it is hard to believe that Drazen Petrovich is dead. There was a chance that this man was going to lead the New Jersey Nets next year and return to Europe to play basketball. There was a chance that the 28-year-old Petrovich would stay with the Nets and continue to be one of the core players in the Nets' resurgence. Now both chances have been dashed. Drazen Petrovich's life was dashed last night on the German Autobahn when the car he was riding in lost control on a rainy, slippery surface and crashed into a truck. Two ladies accompanying Petrovich in the car suffered serious injuries. Drazen Petrovich, who hailed from Croatia, was Europe's first individual success story in the world of basketball. After distinguishing himself as the best player on his continent, he came to the U.S. to the Portland Trailblazers to take on the elite players of the world in the NBA. But it was with the Nets that he blossomed. Coming east in 1991, his stats continued to climb. This past season, Petrovic made third-team All-NBA, led the Nets in scoring, averaging over 22 points per game. But above all, Petrovic loved and lived the game of basketball. He will be deeply missed by all who knew Drazen Petrovic. You know, not only did you know, I lose a good friend, but a great basketball player. You know, Draz, sometimes when he was, you know, he would score or whatever, he would say that little saying that Arnold Schwarzenegger said, I'll be back. <laughs> and he just would, you know, he, he just said some, you know, funny things because his accent would come out and it made everybody on the team laugh. And he just was, you know, he was just a, you know, a happy-go-lucky kind of guy. But those who were happy and lucky to have Drazen Petrovic around are tonight sad and at a loss by his death. And you can imagine the heavy emotions wrought by the Nets management over at the Meadowlands today. Mark Stevens has been there all day and now joins us live. Mark? Scott, walking into the Nets offices today was like walking into the home of a grieving family. Nets general manager Willis Reed said he felt all along he was going to re-sign Petro this summer. Felt he would be able to take aim at more three-pointers here at the Meadowlands. Now one of the cornerstones of this building franchise is gone. The Petro! Four, three! It was that ability to shoot from just about anywhere on the court and his emotional fire that made Drazen Petrovic a Nets favorite. The team's leading scorer last season leaves his NBA team in total shock. I can only remember him as a happy kid, smiling, wanting to win, and uh, playing a game that he loved, and a person who made himself into what he was as a player and a person. He left no stones unturned in terms of uh, trying to make himself the best player he could be. And uh, that's it, we don't get enough players in this game. They care that much about the game. The Nets had an unbelievable run of bad luck due to injuries this past season. All those will heal. The wounds that were opened by the death of Drazen Petrovic, that will take a long time. Reporting live from the Meadowlands, Mark Stevens, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Scott? Mark, thank you very much. And we move on. The heavyweight boxing battle between Big George Foreman and Tommy the Duke Morrison surprised many. Surprising in the fact that it went the distance. These two sluggers went at it for 12 rounds, but Morrison fought a smart fight, beat Foreman to the punch most of the night, and scored the unanimous decision win. So he moves on. As for the 44-year-old Foreman... I don't think I'm going to box anymore. I mean, I kept saying it, and I got my wife thinking about it. She's already saying, we're going to go in the sands of so-and-so. We're going to lay out, and uh, we're going to eat this, and we're going to have this. And so I've given her the impression that for the next year, we're going to ride around and have fun. So if I renege, I may be in trouble. Yeah, he may be in trouble because he already has signs of reneging already today. Both the local baseball teams are in action again tonight. The Mets go for two in a row, hosting the Cubs. They haven't won two straight since April. Starter Anthony Young hasn't won a game in his last 19 decisions. The Yankees try to get back to the Royals in Kansas City. And finally, there is that battle for the Stanley Cup between the Canadiens and the Kings. Montreal up 3-1 over L.A., but that doesn't tell the real story. The overtimes do. Three straight games now. They've gone to sudden death to determine a winner. And for the past two in L.A., John LeClaire has scored the goal to make the difference. Montreal wins its record 10th straight overtime game in playoff action. The final was 3-2. I'm Scott Clark. That's it for sports. Bill? Okay, Scott, thank you very much. Well, it's starting to feel a lot like summer. Sam Champion will be along to talk about the AccuWeather forecast in just a moment after this.
The GMC Jimmy is already loaded with a powerful V6 engine and four-wheel anti-lock brakes standard. And now we've dropped in a few extras. Like reclining seats, air conditioning, a killer stereo, tinted glass, and much more. Now, how do we load you into a Jimmy? With this limited time smart lease. Drop in to your Tri-State GMC truck dealer today. Do the one. A&S One Day Sale. Wednesday. Store-wide. The one with all men's $225 suits. $99.99. All $150 sport coats. $69.99. Get 50% off all cultured pearls. 25% off thousands of shorts and tees. Mrs. Junior's tees. Women. 25% off all Life Stride sandals. The Spring Made Twin for Care Sheet Set. $9.99. Magnavox 19-inch Color Remote. $239. Wednesday only, and it's one day sale. Terrific. There's a whole new excitement in Atlantic City. You gotta see us to believe it. Showboat Casino Hotel. This is a four-wheel drive, four-door Chevy Blazer. The purple skates are mine. It comes with... Traded. A V6, automatic, air, anti-lock brakes, AM, FM, stereo, power windows and locks. Come on, guys, this is a long trip. To Grandma's. Right, sauerkraut. All this, just $2.99 a month and 1000 down. Don't forget dessert. And Blazer is $1,800 less than a comparably equipped Ford Explorer. Granny's cool. Way cool. Just $2.99 a month. Chevy Blazer. Expect more for your family at your local Chevrolet Geo dealer. Well, if this isn't like summer, I don't know what is, Sam. It's beginning to get there, Bill, but wait till sure tomorrow, is. then you'll really think it's like summer. When we approach 90 degrees with this heat tomorrow, right now we're okay, we're comfortable. 72 degrees, relative humidity at 59%. The barometer's steady right now. You will notice in the last few hours that some clouds have made it into the picture. Slow getting here, but we pulled out a really nice day ahead of them. South winds at 6 miles per hour, 95 would have been a record for most of us today. We were right at 80 degrees and then dropped back a little bit, spent most of the day in the high 70s. So here we are with the latest radar shot, and we'll show you what's going on. Radar in motion. Detected some thunderstorms and thunder showers developing off in western Pennsylvania. As they move toward the east, though, these are taking a little hook to the southeast. So most likely to have a problem will be northern Virginia into Maryland tonight, and that's why there's a severe thunderstorm watch out in that area. Also, for western Pennsylvania. No watches out for our region simply because the showers that are moving in our direction seem to be falling apart. They're running into some drier air and they're just not holding in uh, thunderstorm uh, level there. So it looks like we will see some showers and maybe some weak and widely scattered thunder showers with this later on tonight as this moisture moves toward the south. But for tomorrow, it's heat coming up from the south and we've got a lot of it. Out toward the west, it's a big storm and it's been a problem ever since it's been around. Strong area of low pressure moving out of the uh, Rockies, dropped some snow in that direction, pushed some record-setting cold air well back into the southwest. And now as it moves through, it's been causing a lot of havoc with thunderstorms, thunder showers, tornadoes, hailstorms, whole works, uh, everything that you can imagine from a late spring storm beginning to move in toward the uh, Ohio River Valley. As it does, it's weakening, though, and we will see some effects from it and likely will get the heat. Tomorrow, what happens is warm front lifts north and lifts over us over the night uh, time hours tonight into early in the morning. So that puts us right in territory of steam heat. Today, temperatures down to the southeast, 90s into 100s, and we will hit the 90-degree mark tomorrow for most of us. Even though out on the island, it'll be a little cooler, about 8 to 10 degrees cooler tomorrow out toward the island. But in town and west of town, 90 degrees is likely hot and humid. It's steamy. The whole summer ball of wax tomorrow. Mostly cloudy, scattered thunderstorms tonight, but I don't think it's a big deal. Just some showers moving through in the 60s for us. 90 degrees tomorrow, hazy, hot, and humid, and it'll feel every bit of it to 92 on Thursday. This run lasts two days. Cold front comes through, knocks it out, 86 degrees on the following day, and cooler and drier for the weekend, Bill. Interesting week, Sam. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Tonight on Eyewitness News at 11, we'll have complete live coverage of New Jersey's gubernatorial primary. And they've been in legal limbo for 20 months, but now a judge will allow dozens of Haitian refugees with the virus that causes AIDS to come into the United States. The decision has met with mixed reaction. How will the Clinton administration respond, and what are the Haitian people here in New York thinking about it? And Japan's royal wedding will begin only moments from now. We're going to bring you all the pageantry of this historic marriage tonight at 11. Finally, the Golden Venture brought about 300 Chinese to the Rockaways on Sunday morning and dumped them. Now there are problems.